Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is the first in a series of events the Columbia University Center on Global Energy Policy is hosting as part of Climate Week NYC. My name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy. This event's being webcast live. The full video is gonna be available online later this evening. And for those of you joining us via Zoom, you can submit a question at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today, we are honored and delighted to be joined by the Honorable Kevin Rudd, who currently serves as President and CEO of the Asia Society. Mr. Rudd's distinguished career includes serving as the 26th Prime Minister of Australia, as well as Australia's Foreign Minister. Mr. Rudd began his career as a China scholar. He's fluent in Mandarin and served as an Australian diplomat in Beijing before entering politics. He's also a veteran, of, a veteran climate change diplomat. He led Australia's delegation to the Copenhagen Climate Conference in 2009, which is where we first met. He is, in my experience, one of the most thoughtful observers on international relations and climate change diplomacy in the world today. Kevin Rudd, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be with you, David, <clears throat> and, um, and uh, greetings from Australia, where it's tomorrow. <laughs> Well, and what time is it where you are, Kevin? It's just gone 8 a.m. So this is a respectable hour for um, dealing with our friends in the East Coast of the United States. So I'm more than relaxed. Often I'm up at uh, midnight and two o'clock in the morning doing stuff in America. So this is actually a good time. Well, thank you. And, and not only is it early in the morning, but I know um, uh, it's a matter of public record, uh, Pr Mr. Prime Minister, that today is your birthday. So let me start off by wishing you a happy birthday and tell you how honored we are that you would join us on your birthday here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, David. Um, you get to a stage in life where you try to push these birthdays off the horizon. Um, <laughs> but uh, as my wife said uh, to me uh, earlier today, why does your birthday always happen in UN week? I said, because <laughs> A, they've never changed my birth date and B, they're unlikely to change when UN week happens. So, but because it's climate week, um, we've got a dispensation to carve out a single event today and that's this one, David, so for my birthday. Well, again, happy birthday and thank you so much. Let, let's Good. start with nuclear submarines. Uh, it's, it's not a topic that is a, climate change topic per se, but it's it's been in the news as a result of an agreement, which I think most of our audience members are, have probably seen in the press, but in case they haven't, I'll just say that uh, the Australian, British, and US governments agreed last week on uh, a deal with respect to nuclear submarines. Uh, it's been controversial that uh, Australia had an agreement with France to develop nuclear submarines, and the French are unhappy and withdrew their ambassador from Washington, DC. Um, what are your thoughts on the agreement, Mr. Prime Minister? I think basically there are massive flaws in the agreement. Um, when I was Prime Minister, we produced a defence white paper, probably 2009, uh, covering out our own Australian Defence Force requirements through to 2030. We then launched a proposal which was accepted on all sides of politics to then double the Australian conventional submarine fleet uh, to 12 boats. Uh, and we then began a process of um, putting out to tender how those would be built in Adelaide and our shipyards in South Australia. Uh, and then we ran through a series of conventional submarine tenderers uh, from Japan, from Germany, and also from France. The French won the tender. And for the French, it was a big project. It's like it's a $90 billion project. So this is not a piece of loose change when you're starting to build submarines. And so roll the clock along, um, that decision was taken, in fact, in 2016, after I had left office, that is the awarding of the contract. And then suddenly, like a bolt from the blue, literally at the end of last week, the current Conservative government of Australia, led by Mr Morrison, unilaterally, as it were, repudiated the contract, said instead that Australia would move from conventionally powered submarines to nuclear powered submarines. And secondly, the contract with the French was therefore null and void. And thirdly, instead, it will be provided by an as yet unspecified Anglo-American consortium. 
So the issues in the Australian political debate as we head towards our next national elections are is, A, how much is this just coloured by domestic politics by making the current Australian Conservative government look suitably hairy-chested on China? B, uh, is this a way to treat a French partner, friend and ally? To which my answer is no. And C, if you are, are going to move for technical reasons from conventionally powered boats to uh, nuclear powered submarines, which for us would be a first, um, then the French make these things as well. So why can't the French be invited to tender? Uh, because they also run uh, nuclear submarines. So that's a um, that's where the controversy is up to today. And you'll see me in the pages of Le Monde on this in the next uh, 24 hours, probably earning the wrath of the Australian government for doing so. Yeah, could, could you talk about um, civil nuclear power in Australia and how that might relate to this? I think many of our viewers may not be familiar with that. Well, Australia has had a long, long tradition um, of uh, opposing a, a domestic civil nuclear industry. And the reasons for it is that the British in the 1950s conducted a whole bunch of nuclear tests in the Australian desert. And then the French, uh, ironically, in the period between the 70s and the 90s, conducted a whole series of nuclear tests in the South Pacific and the French colonies uh, in and around French Polynesia. Uh, it's a Mororoa at all. So the domestic political consensus in this country, uh, despite our ability to turn nuclear tomorrow if we wanted to, because we've got all the technology and all the ability to do that, is that there is no domestic political consensus to develop civil nuclear reactors. So this raises a big question in the internal debate in Australia as well, which is if you're going to have a fleet of eight or 12 nuclear powered submarines and end up therefore probably with the fourth or fifth largest uh, nuclear powered uh, submarine fleet in the world, then um, how are you gonna service these things? Uh, because if we don't have a civil nuclear capacity or industry within the country, uh, what happens uh, with the um, propulsion systems, et cetera? So, and therefore, if we don't have that domestic capacity, are we effectively saying that this uh, fleet of boats becomes a subset of the United States Navy and is serviced exclusively either in uh, Honolulu on the West Coast or wherever, which ignites a separate question as to whether Australian strategic policy is always a subset of American strategic policy or whether we have strategic autonomy when we choose to. So that's part of the coloration of the debate here in Australia as well. Well, let, let's, let's shift to climate change, which is, of course, our main focus today. And um, say a word about, about climate change politics in Australia today. What is the policy of the current government and, and what do you foresee? in the years ahead? Well, the current Australian government um, uh, has been dominated by um, climate change skeptics uh, for quite a period of time. Uh, really, uh, from the time I was first elected in 2007, uh, when we lost office at the end of 2013, it was climate change, as it was skepticism, uh, almost denialism which was part of the Conservatives' campaign against my government in that election. And over the last seven years or so, um, any effort by the current Conservative government in Canberra to move towards a more progressive, uh, towards a more ambitious set of proposals on A, domestic greenhouse gas reduction, B, let alone taking an activist posture in the international organisations, which you and I are familiar with, David, uh, not least being the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, is constantly undermined by this domestic political agenda driven by, comp by denialism and scepticism and turbocharged, I've got to say, by the Murdoch media in this country. You think you have a Murdoch problem with Fox in the United States? Uh, Murdoch runs not just a Fox equivalent in Australia called Sky, um, but um, also controls 70% of the print media in Australia. So um, to get things done on climate change, you're faced always with this coalition of conservative forces, the Murdoch party, as I call them in Australia. And then that you've got also the conservative parties formally acting in coalition to push uh, climate change action into the margins, if not to just fundamentally oppose any progressive or forward movement. Yeah, I've, uh... Is it fair to say that Australia and the United States have a number of similarities in this regard? I mean, they're both continental countries, obviously, both with a frontier history, um, both with diverse climate um, in different parts of the country. Um, and, and then the, the climate change politics is characterized by at least 
some influence of skepticism and denialism in a, in a way that's unusual in other countries. Is that one is, is, is that fair? And are, are there significant differences? I know, you know, you're a keen observer of the United States. Well, I've lived in the United States for the better part of the last five or six years. So I've got some familiarity with how these uh, climate debates are conducted in America uh, between what I describe as um, the, the denialist far right and sometimes center right, um, usually through the platform of, um, of uh, Murdoch's Fox Network um, and, uh, and then those seeking to bring about real change in the United States. So the similarities are there. I think they are probably along these lines. Uh, we're um, uh, a large country. Uh, we have a very big uh, agricultural sector and we have a very big mining sector, a very big energy sector, um, and, uh, and therefore a very big hydrocarbon sector. And as a former um, uh, progressive political leader in this country, my home state is one of the largest coal producing areas in Australia and one of the largest coal exporting uh, areas in the world. So get, navigating the politics of this as a domestic Australian politician uh, is uh, always tricky. But when you've got one side of politics just simply opportunistically lining up around an argument which says, if you act on climate change, you'll collapse the economy tomorrow and lose jobs and lose opportunities and close businesses. The resonances of that debate, as we've seen it in America, uh, are certainly writ large in this country as well. In fact, the conservative forces in the two countries exchange notes the whole time in terms of how to defeat climate change action in both of those countries. Well, as I said in, in my introduction, you were a China scholar before you were a politician and are fluent in Mandarin. I spent a lot of time in China, uh, which is obviously an exceedingly important country when it comes to climate change, um, largest emitter in the world by far. Uh, it's about a year ago today uh, that President Xi announced that he was going to set a goal that China would become carbon neutral by 2060, which got a lot of attention. Um, in, in the interim, there's been a lot of attention to the continued approvals of coal plants in China, notwithstanding that goal. And I wonder how you assess Chinese climate change policies. So, um, as to their level of seriousness, their level of sufficiency, what, what are your thoughts broadly? And then I'd like to talk about some specific topics, but what are your thoughts broadly? So far, while it may be unpopular to say this, China on climate change policy and climate change action as of September, 2021 is, um, probably a glass just half full rather than a glass just half empty. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to recognize why. Uh, the journey at which they've traveled since Copenhagen, David, you will well remember when China and India uh, together with their acolytes around the world uh, basically took out their equivalent of a uh, climate change submarine and sought to torpedo whatever action, uh, combined action we were seeking to bring about in Copenhagen. Nonetheless, we did come through with the Copenhagen Accord. So from that posture in 2009 of, let's call it, overt hostility uh, to where we are in 2021, it's been a long journey for the Chinese. Um, turning to the present, however, um, you're right to point out the fact that uh, 12 months ago, when Xi Jinping delivered his uh, General Assembly address, as he's speaking again to the General Assembly, I think today in New York, um, we had this uh, quite remarkable statement from Xi committed to um, achieving uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. The current, as it were, doxology almost of, um, of Chinese uh, carbon policy, it hangs around these two carbon commitments, which is uh, carbon neutrality by 2060 and carbon peaking by 2030. Now, you and I, David, both know that if we're going to keep global temperature increases uh, beneath one point, uh, at 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade by the end of the century, neither of those commitments is at this stage sufficient. Compared with where they were before, they are improved. So the, the, both the policy and the politics and the diplomacy of where we stand with China is to fashion the international political debate to encourage the Chinese to improve on both of those 
to bring, as it were, uh, carbon uh, for them peaking down to 2025, and certainly to bring their, uh, their carbon neutrality commitment back to 2050. And while they're at it, to include not just carbon, but the greenhouse gas emissions as well. Now that's all within the realm of possibility, but still continuing political difficulty. But if we manage the debate effectively with the Chinese, it's, in, it's certainly doable. You know, I think to, to many observers around the world, particularly people who haven't, you know, lived in China or, or you know, studied there, it's a black box and very hard to understand what the forces are within the country. And you've had the opportunity to live there and study Chinese political system. In a scenario in which the Chinese government does make the forward steps that you were just suggesting, um, how do, how do you, what forces do you think would lead to that within the Chinese system? Um, what, why would that come about? Um, and, and if it doesn't, why would it not come about? At a policy level, uh, the Chinese uh, ultimately, given the strong influence, frankly, by the old Soviet Union in the formation of China's political and bureaucratic apparatus in the 1950s, are very much a science-driven crew. Mm -hmm. uh, Ultimately, they believe in the hard sciences. Uh, the, the leadership of this country in China are either engineers, um, physicists, um, or, um, or uh, those who derive from what we would describe as um, uh, a range of uh, very practical um, scientific uh, and uh, engineering professions. Uh, social scientists are lacking uh, in the Chinese system, and that is a separate question, uh, which will we can talk about when we next have a forum on human rights. But in terms of the hard sciences on questions of climate, ultimately, the Chinese domestic conclusion, in my view, David, is pretty simple. They worked out sometime around 2010 to 2012 that not only was this real, but that potentially represented a torpedo amidships to China's aspiration to become a global great power. Hmm. And that is that the domestic impact of climate change on China itself, on its economy, on the well-being of its people, even on the question of, uh, of air pollution, uh, and given the intersection between that debate and uh, on particulate matter and, and uh, greenhouse gas concentrations, was such that the Chinese Communist Party believed that they had to change posture. So roll that clock uh, forward to the present, so you've got this, uh, frankly, quite literate, as you know, David, from your own experience in dealing with the Chinese, uh, scientifically informed, large slices now of the Chinese bureaucracy, not just at the um, Ministry of Environmental uh, Planning uh, and Protection, uh, but also in the national planning apparatus of the country at large, who get the science, who understand the policy implications. Now, at the same time, their system, despite it being a one-party state, still has an, an aggregation of industry interests uh, hun, uh, around the Ministry of Energy, the old coal uh, ministries, etc., all uh, becoming enormously powerful bureaucracies and state-owned corporations at the same time, yeah. all of whom will be in the other ear of Xi Jinping saying, yes, but Comrade Xi, if you do this, you understand the implications in Shanxi and Shanxi, you understand what will happen in terms of uh, employment here and there, and you understand the uh, net economic consequences in terms of uh, uh, our uh, energy costs in a unit of production, etc. But all the debates you and I are familiar with globally in this audience that we're speaking to today, David, are had within China, but in a closed system. Mm -hmm. So far, I would describe that the forces for progress are kind of ahead in this debate, 52-48. <laughs> and uh, it is a daily battle. So every time you feel like criticizing Xi Jinping and his team, understand that for the lack of Chinese public ambition and change, understand that the internal fight within their system, which never reaches uh, the, the, the newspapers, obviously, given it's a one-party state, is very fierce. But as I said, I use advisedly the term, it's a glass just half full rather than one half empty. Xie Zhenhua, you just mentioned, is the longtime Chinese special climate envoy of ministerial rank and a leading Chinese climate expert in China. Yeah. Um, um, are, are the provincial governments important in, in this whole discussion? 
They are, um, David, there's a, an expression in Chinese, which is shang yu zheng ce, xia yu dei ce, which is above we have policies and below we have counter policies. And, uh, <laughs> and so the ability to unravel stuff on the ground uh, as the Chinese system uh, at a provincial and sub-provincial level is able to, as it were, work its way around. However, that has been the case at least until Xi Jinping's statement to the UN General Assembly last year. Now it's a question of Xi Jinping's personal political standing and face that is on the line. And what I have now noticed in uh, the Chinese official literature on this subject, People's Daily Commentaries and all the rest of it, where you see the mar marginal ebbs and flows within the Chinese official orthodoxy on these questions, Xi Jinping now ensuring that the national planning apparatus in China takes these two carbon commitments about peaking in 2030 and neutrality by 2060 and drilling it right down to frankly the provincial and sub-provincial level. So you will be assessed in terms of your future promotion on your ability to deliver, just as you were assessed 10 years ago on your ability to deliver jobs alone. So this is now, I think, a corrective within their system. So I think they are serious uh, at the Beijing level. At this stage, not yet serious enough from a planetary level. But if I'm tracking the trajectory so far, reasonable. Apart from what we've seen so far on the Belt and Road Initiative, but that's a separate subject. Uh, but since you raised it, let's talk about it. That's uh, you know hugely important. And um, over the course of the past you know five to ten years, under the auspices of the Belt and Road Initiative, Chinese state-owned enterprises and Chinese financial institutions have provided enormous capital for construction of high-carbon infrastructure. Um, also, enormous capital for renewable energy, but far more for high carbon infrastructure. How, how do you reconcile that with the, um, the belief in the science of climate change that you were discussing? Well, that is really one of the key terrains for the battleground within the system in China right now. And again, you won't see this publicly articulated, but that's what it's all about. Not all about, I mean, there's a big domestic component to the agenda as well. The Chinese are acutely conscious that there's been a, a large uh, construction of coal-fired power stations financed under Belt and Road Initiative um, uh, financial instruments uh, over recent years. The Chinese response to that is, uh, why attack us when the South Koreans and Japanese have been doing exactly the same in providing soft finance for coal-fired power constructions around the world? Except that, of course, partly in response to international pressure, uh, Korea and Japan have recently announced fundamental changes on that. And what I see early signs of is that perhaps as early as Glasgow, we may begin to see the Chinese make definitive commitments in terms of the BRI for the future, make it green. That means no more coal-fired power stations. That means no more Chinese finance for coal-fired power stations. And then there's a question of that mean also no more um, provision of Chinese uh, labor and engineering expertise to do it as well, if they were financed technically beyond the BRI machinery. So this debate is live right now. I would not be surprised if Xi Jinping, maybe even at the UN General Assembly, maybe through whoever represents China at Glasgow at COP26, begins to take a more definitive position on that. Certainly it's where China needs to go because the BRR economies collectively, um, not too many years from now, will represent half of uh, to total global emissions between them. This relates to a question that we received from Gabriel uh, Abgarinos. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, who, who asks, can you please discuss the coal situation and outlook vis-a-vis -vis climate change uh, in China? Um, and from Australia's point of view, in terms of coal mining exports and coal power generation. Yeah, we cannot walk around the, uh, the problem uh, of coal, nor can we walk around the opportunity, frankly, of uh, renewable energy transformation of economies currently dependent on either coal exports or coal-fired power generation. Uh, and this is where a lot of the demonology and the politics of uh, Western countries in the United States, look at Virginia, look at West Virginia, look at uh, my country, Australia, look at the states of Queensland, New South Wales, and uh, frankly, the big coal producing provinces of Shanxi and Shanxi in China. 
um, the debates are parallel. So um, in terms of where China is going on this, uh, you will, you've already begun to see the emergence of Chinese commitments in terms of changes to its overall national energy mix that is in the direction of a greater renewable energy component. From memory, the current Chinese uh, commitment uh, is to have uh, one quarter of their total uh, energy mix represented by renewables. Um, the, in, the internal planning work uh, in China is to in fact increase that uh, to somewhere like 50%, but I don't know what the target date is. And of course, that would be at the expense of coal. Importantly, however, it still excludes gas um, and it still excludes oil, which as we know are also hydrocarbons. But China domestically for the scientific and economic reasons I referred to before, David, has got the message on coal, but it's transition politics and policy abroad through the BRI and at home through the uh, renewable energy um, uh, change in the overall energy mix is underway, again, not fast enough uh, for the planet's needs. Australia, um, the current Australian government, um, the Conservative government, uh, frankly, its commitments on greenhouse gas reductions uh, within the uh, COP26 uh, UNFCCC framework are woefully inadequate. Um, uh, the current uh, level of ambition is somewhere between uh, 25, 26% reduction against 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, at present, um, the Prime Minister, Mr. Morrison, has indicated no fundamental change on that. Um, I suspect by the time we get to um, uh, COP26 and that his best buddy of submarine fame, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, will be, as it were, the de facto chair of uh, COP26 in Glasgow. But as we speak right now, the pressure between London and Canberra for them to lift the uh, commitment uh, by Australia to something more respectable that is in the vicinity of 50% uh, reduction uh, using 2005 um, benchmark by 2030 is I think within the realm of possibility and finally hauling them across the line to do what every other developed country has done, which is to accept um, carbon neutrality by 2050. But it's like extracting teeth. Um, and of course, the big component within that is coal and the failure of the current government of Australia to bring about effective, shall we say, uh, transformation within the domestic energy uh, industry within this country as well. Let's shift to relations between the US and China. There's extraordinary interview over the weekend you might have seen in which the UN Secretary General, uh, good, Mr. Guterres, described the relationship between the US and China as, quote, completely dysfunctional, uh, and um, said that uh, a new Cold War uh, would poorly serve the world in a variety of different ways. Um, before we get to climate change in particular, I wonder, just as a former diplomat, Kind of any reflections on U.S.-China relations, uh, rising power, and, and those dynamics? Yeah, and my request to the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is to actually take to both capitals, that is, both Washington and Beijing, a concrete proposal for them both on climate action for Glasgow to actually break this impasse. And I think there's a real opportunity for um, UN leadership here and now on this question because the underlying characterization which Guterres, Guterres offers is largely accurate. Um, it is no longer a structurally functional relationship given that most of it is conducted uh, through uh, each country's news media and a series of public announcements. The one carve out though, David, is so far a highly civilized, professional uh, and productive relationship between John Kerry uh, President Biden's uh, special envoy on climate change and Xi Jinping, his Chinese equivalent, where within the political constraints of both capitals, who are currently locked in a new form of strategic competition, which may degenerate into a new form of Cold War uh, as the decade progresses, but we're not there yet. Those two are at least holding together the framework of a discussion, a conversation, negotiation about what we can, what these two largest emitters in the world, China and the United States, can do by way of combined global leadership uh, at Glasgow and beyond. So it's not dead yet, this one. It's still alive. It's flapping. 
but it still needs, um, shall we say, the injection of oxygen to keep it alive um, at that level. I'm optimistic that we can do that, but the constraints are real. Are there specific areas that you think are most fruitful for cooperation between the US and China on climate change issues? The Chinese on the one hand, vis-a-vis -vis their uh, commitments on uh, carbon peaking and on uh, carbon neutrality and the inclusion of um, uh, non-carbon greenhouse gases in their overall uh, commitments. The Chinese, I believe, will over time uh, make those commitments stronger, but they will be at pains domestically and internationally to do so, not in response to what the US will ask them to do and not in response to what the collective West asked them to do. So um, uh, it will therefore be very much at, uh, uh, at a timing and, an, and at a venue of Xi Jinping's choosing, which is why I go back to my point before about Guterres. And the UN uh, and the good offices of the UN Secretary General should be used on this occasion. In the rest of the US um, uh, China uh, climate partnership, uh, I believe on the technology front and uh, the renewable energy technology front, there are multiple uh, opportunities for these two countries to possibly work together. David, you're deeply familiar with where we got to in terms of the climate change cooperation agreements between the Obama administration and the Chinese in that period leading up to Paris in 2015. All that um, agenda is there still rich for the taking and the development in each of those categories and subcategories. We don't have to reinvent that wheel. It's there. The key thing is to mobilise it uh, for the collective good of the planet. I think that's doable. John Kerry, as we know, um, great man, uh, is never short of ideas. He's never short of energy. He's never short of diplomatic enthusiasm. The same with Xie Jinhua, who is an entrepreneur, a climate entrepreneur within his own problematic system. Uh, for the rest of us, I think it is to bring pressure to bear on the rest of the Chinese and American administrations to carve out the political and diplomatic space to get this level of collaboration done and advanced. It's doable particularly in renewables, but also in terms of what may be achievable by way of combined global climate change finance uh, in terms of the global green fund uh, by the time we get to um, uh, get to guys go as well. We have a, a question from uh, Shang Yun Ye, who is a, a non-resident fellow with our center um, at Columbia uh, along these lines. And it, he highlights the challenges that may be faced here. He, Shang Yu writes, um, it's reported that Chinese Minister uh, Wang Yi commented to the effect that if U.S. and its allies continue to take the hostile, hostile approach to China on issues such as the Australia-UK-USA nuclear submarine agreement, it might force China to take a non-cooperative approach to climate change issues. Do you foresee that type of dynamic um, potentially playing out in the months ahead? Well, that certainly reflects the Chinese official line, um, that comment and observation which is <clears throat> at two levels. What China has said, if you look carefully at their uh, briefing in and around the most recent visit to uh, China by John Kerry uh, earlier in September was, you want progress on climate? We need to see progress across the rest of the US-China relationship vis-a-vis -vis broader normalization. The US posture and response is, climate is a freestanding issue. It, we have planetary responsibilities here and we need to quarantine it out from the other dynamics, geopolitical, military, economic, technological, which currently dominate the rest of the US-China relationship. Mm -hmm. And so these are the two, as it were, non-comprehending universes speaking to each other at the moment. My appeal to both governments, you'd expect me to say this, but I think it actually makes sense in terms of each country's national interests. Each, if you look at the um, range of unfolding natural disasters in the United States, not just over the summer, but on a rolling and regular basis, not just fires, extreme weather events more broadly and drought. But similarly in China, uh, often less reported, there is a deep national interest for both countries to do this. And in fact, what both countries should be doing at present is focusing on what do we do about India? <laughs> because <laughs> India, in the, in the face of this geopolitical contest between China and the United States broadly, and then 
narrowly in terms of whether climate change collaboration is conditional or otherwise on the rest of the improvement of relationship. This other emerging major emitter, India, is at this stage largely off the map in terms of substantive commitments uh, for around Glasgow, as they were largely off the map in terms of substantive commitments coming out of Paris. So I would encourage both Beijing and Washington to think carefully about Delhi um, and think carefully about the planet, because between China, the United States, India, Japan, and Europe, therein lies the future of whether we get to 1.5 degrees or worse by century's end. That's a perfect transition to talking about multilateral climate change diplomacy. And um, you're a veteran of that. I guess, as I said in my introduction as well, you were at the Copenhagen conference. Um, what, what lessons did you take away from the Copenhagen conference? Um, always look after your scar tissue in the morning. I think that's uh, <laughs> the, uh, well, as you know, international climate diplomacy, uh, Dave, is not for the faint hearted. Uh, it's a very willing contact sport. And, uh, and, uh, and coming from countries of, uh, of uh, contact football, I think we both understand what that means. Uh, it's, it's tough, uh, uh, but it's also technically complex. But at the end of the day, you get agreement at these conferences uh, based on one thing, political will and political momentum coming out of the exercise of political will. What made Paris happen was frankly, three things. Uh, one, uh, President Obama, uh, by the time we had moved from Copenhagen to Paris, having really got religion on climate. Two, Xi Jinping, early in his period, thinking that there was still a productive US relationship to pursue, being reluctantly persuaded by uh, President Obama that that was the case. Hence the agreements prior to Paris about China's um, embrace of the, uh, the Paris framework and its own national commitments. And thirdly, it was the effectiveness, frankly, of, of French diplomacy uh, and uh, the, uh, the extraordinary work of the French uh, team um, around uh, uh, the foreign minister and uh, around uh, so many other senior French officials, which made it work. So the alchemy hasn't changed in terms of how these things work. So it's the political will in uh, Washington uh, and in Beijing to make Glasgow work, um, creating the momentum necessary to pull everyone else in its slipstream. And then making sure that the Brits um, uh, are able to conduct the final element of the alchemy uh, at the conference itself. So I think the lessons of Copenhagen are like those of Paris and will be those of Glasgow as well. To be fair to the Brits, not having everyone physically in the room like we had in Paris and like we had in Copenhagen is a problem. A lot of people are only going to be there virtually because of COVID. Uh, but I still think um, we can uh, push through this. Uh, and, uh, but it's going to require, I think, a very dexterous performance on the part of President Biden to find a formula through which to work with Xi Jinping as they move towards the conclusion of the uh, COP26 outcome. I can't resist sharing a story in light of your mention of being in the room in Copenhagen because it's the first time we were ever in the same room together, Mr. Prime Minister, and I, I was a backbencher and you were at the table with about a dozen or 15 other prime minister, or heads of state. Um, and uh, the, the negotiations were going nowhere and heads of state were there trying to rescue them, as you may remember. And, and what my memory is, is I recall you saying, you providing a textual edit to the, um, to the agreement. And, and you, you read out a sentence that you, I had seen you write. And I remember I had two reactions. One of them was, that was a superb textual edit, uh, just exactly the right comment. And two, I can't believe a prime minister is actually offering textual edits to, to an agreement. It was, it, was, it was not the role the heads of state should have been in at that moment. Um, you know, it's a funny old thing about systems, though. And one of the reasons we ended up in that problem in uh, Copenhagen was because uh, in the green room made up of heads of government, heads of state from effectively the G20 and some other smaller economies as well. Uh, neither the Chinese nor the Indians were prepared to be representative head, head of state, head of government level. But at that point, 
whether you like it or not, your political leaders have to take up the pen because that's the only point at which you are going to achieve the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it means that as you head into Copenhagen, uh, sorry, as you head into Glasgow, that frankly, a group of heads of government are going to have to read their brief, imbibe it, understand it, and work within it. So that I can't remember the textual amendment concerned, but I did come up with language about two degrees, which is, uh, for example, to ensure that uh, we kept temperature increases by the end of the century uh, uh, up to two degrees, because I was working between the small island developing states, countries like Bangladesh, and where the mood of the, the conference was, which two degrees was just far too far. So finding the language uh, which can actually land people at a point where you maximize the ambition while recognizing the political constraints, you need several of the political leaders in the room to be across the brief and with a pen <laughs> so that you can make that change at the right moment. I can testify that you were, you were there doing that. Um, are, are there specific um, uh, bars that you think need to be uh, crossed for Glasgow to be a success? Um, you know, for example, you mentioned two degrees. There's a lot of discussion about 1.5 degrees, um, a view that the Paris Agreement wasn't strong enough on 1.5 degrees and that um, the science has evolved since 2015 and the world needs to say more. Um, that there are other ideas out there. What, what are you looking for to determine whether or not the Glasgow meeting is a success? I think um, what will become known and possibly already is known as the Glasgow package uh, will be a range of individual um, initiatives, I hope. One will be, obviously, if, if you like, there is the mechanical element of this, which is where we are we now in terms of these nationally determined contributions. A number of governments have yet to submit them yet, and that's quite critical to the outcome, frankly, across the board. Uh, China has yet to provide its updated commitment, but that's where uh, Xi Jinping's statement to the General Assembly today is important. Remember that 1 July was technically the threshold date for getting in your new nationally determined commitments, which for this audience means what you're agreeing to by way of uh, a new ambition to bring down your global, uh, your own greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Uh, in order to make the long-term commitments of 1.5 slash 2 degrees centigrade uh, scientifically meaningful. So frankly, what's one benchmark for success? To make sure that the NDCs, as we call them within the trade, are robust. China, and what it does in its NDC will be critical. President Biden has already indicated the direction which America is going. Uh, the Commonwealth of Australia has not announced its yet. But as I said before, I'm optimistic that domestic political pressure in Australia will force the Conservatives to adopt a more robust posture, both on uh, its 2030 commitments as well as carbon neutrality. So that's one element. But the second is on 1.5 degrees, David, we need to have um, defined pathways now to get there. Um, if the science now, based on the, the latest uh, IPCC report, is that it's 1.5 degrees or bust, and that's kind of my view, and has long been my view, then you need robust pathways uh, for uh, the political community to get there um, and not um, pathways which um, are so broadly and ambiguously drafted as they actually cease to have meaningful policy effect. But there's a third element to success as well, and it's to do with our solidarity with uh, the um, uh, emerging markets in the developing world. Uh, in Copenhagen, with the pen, I was part of the agreement for, to sign off on a $100 billion uh, uh, commitment to a global climate fund, which would assist with um, uh, climate change adaptation uh, for countries around the world who are directly affected, countries like Bangladesh, the Pacific Island states, um, the, uh, the Maldives, countries that we're all familiar with. That's still not fully delivered, needs to be delivered. And parallel to that, I would say, a wider act of solidarity uh, with uh, the developing world, um, or, albeit not on the agenda of uh, COP26, of uh, a new form of global solidarity brokered by the UN in terms of uh, vaccines and pandemic management globally, so that the, the developing world gets it, that the developed world does not regard uh, developing countries as simply some important piece of additional greenhouse gas emissions add-on 
but actually is representing a huge slice of humanity who are facing fundamental existential challenges induced by both uh, their economic development uh, pr profile plus the impact of this pandemic. The solidarity, frankly, on the virus and on, pand and on vaccines, making sure that the $100 billion fund is delivered and enhanced in real terms to be meaningful given the cost of adaptation together with the other measures I've just referred to. I think they would be the benchmarks of success. John Odell asks in, in the chat um, about climate finance and opportunities for US-China cooperation. Do, do you think that the finance topic you were just touching on is a place that the US and China could work together? I think they will not probably um, be willing to work through a joint financing facility uh, they may not even be willing to overtly, as it were, uh, close the gap together in terms of the $100 billion plus facility we spoke of. But it may be possible uh, for China separately, perhaps uh, with the United States, uh, even through a World Bank facility, uh, to actually begin to close this gap. Uh, I would say to the World Bank, for example, step up to the plate in this. The World Bank should be the place where most of this hard work is done. It's got the infrastructure, it's got the expertise, it's got the credibility, it's got the transparency, it's got the history. Mm -hmm. And so if people are worried about separate national climate change adjustment funds being established and will the funds be properly expended or not. We have a 75 year old institution called the World Bank, um, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is, sorry, 65 year old institution uh, 75, 65, it'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, established in 1944, uh, which um, uh, has an enormous amount uh, of expertise to offer here. So to answer your question on finance, David, uh, if I was president of the World Bank right now, I'd be coming, walking into the door in Beijing and Washington and in Brussels and saying, here's the vehicle for doing this, here's the expertise to do it, and, and here is how you can help with our balance sheet. And guess what? That's using effective multilateralism to solve a common global problem. We have many more questions in from the audience that we're going to have time to get to, but let me let me just ask a few of them. I have a, a question from my colleague, uh, Julio Friedman, who's one of the global experts on a number of issues, including hydrogen, as well as CCUS and carbon dioxide removal. And um, Julio asks, uh, would, would the prime minister discuss blue and green hydrogen? And, how that's affecting both domestic climate policies, regional geopolitics and trade. Is that an issue that you've had a chance to pay attention to? Yeah, um, and certainly most of our countries uh, hydrogen um, as an alternative uh, uh, clean energy fuel is now gone from the margins of the debate to the center of the debate. And one of the encouraging things in this country, Australia, which is so hydro hydrocarbon rich, is that the, um, is that the big hydrocarbon uh, producing areas of Australia now have ambitious hydrogen uh, energy projects underway. Um, for example, in my own state of uh, Queensland, which I said is one of the largest coal producing areas of the world, the state government here, uh, run by the um, uh, progressive parties in Australia, is now radically unfolding a new hydrogen plan for the state and by way of hydrogen energy for export as well. Similarly, in the state of Western Australia, which is a massive um, uh, iron ore exporting uh, area in the world, the largest iron ore producer in the world, um, uh, bigger than Vale in Brazil. And again, uh, while it's not producing its own hydrocarbons, um, uh, as far as coal is concerned, very large scale hydrogen uh, energy projects on the drawing board there as well. And where that becomes significant in Western Australia as well, is that offshore we have a massive um, uh, LNG projects and what's called the uh, Northwest Shelf. I think it's the third largest reserve in the world. Huge source of uh, LNG exports to China and Northeast Asia. Hydrogen again, becoming an emerging new industry in that part of uh, Australia. I see the same developments uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, I would hope by the time we get to our future conferences of the parties, hydrogen will have moved from here in the debate to hear into the debate, given the enormous potential which it uh, offers uh, for energy security, energy certainty, um, but also, uh, of course, um, uh, 
uh, the future of, um, of uh, climate change. We have a number of questions from some former Schwartzman scholars. I know you've been very involved with that program, Mr. Prime Minister. We have a question from Will Cullen and Elliot. Elliot David asks about the, a related topic, CCUS and carbon dioxide removal and Australia's potential contribution in that area. Can, can Australia make a difference um, either on its own or with China in helping to promote CCUS and carbon dioxide removal? Um, if uh, it's just a question about carbon capture and storage, or is it about something else? Yes, uh, yes, carbon capture and storage. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I've long believed that the science needs to be um, exhausted on this in office. Uh, I established in 2008 something called the Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute in Australia, funded with seed capital of 1.5 billion Australian dollars to look at the four extant. CCS technologies with the object by 2020 of bringing at least one project in Australia to scale. That has not yet happened. Uh, the largest ones in this country, I think, are quite um, still micro generating projects, but it still means that this is a live sector for further development. For those interested in this debate, uh, go to the GC, uh, uh, the Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute website. Part of its mission statement is to aggregate what is happening in the world right now in this space. Secondly, uh, where the technologies are up to. And thirdly, which projects are closest to, be, to achieving scale. This, I believe, should be fully explored as part of the total energy mix and the, the total, as it were, uh, climate change policy response to future energy needs, as well as hydrogen, as well as the classical renewable energies in order to get to our 1.5 degree target. We have a number of questions about kind of political will and political issues around climate change broadly. And Sophia Chan writes, there's a common issue of tragedy of the commons where the average person doesn't believe their actions and choices make any difference on climate change. You have great authority and a voice that millions of people listen to. What everyday actions would you say that individuals can do? with respect to climate change. You know something, and I really thank uh, whoever has asked this question for having placed it into our conversation today. My message to everybody listening to this broadcast is that uh, each of you is enormously powerful because the cumulative impact of frankly, your voices on your local congressman, your local congresswoman, a Republican or Democrat across the United States actually matters, it aggregates over time. And my case study for that is here in Australia. I have fought and won elections on climate change as the Prime Minister of this country. I have fought and lost elections on climate change as the Prime Minister of this country. And I have the scar tissue to prove both of those. <laughs> and so, but let me tell you, political leadership from above is one thing, but until it meets, frankly, a social movement from below, uh, you will not bring about a durable solution. So let me give you two lines of encouragement. Why is it that two weeks ago, the Murdoch empire, historically the cheerleaders of climate, ch climate change denialism and climate change skepticism around the world, um, the greatest supporters of the Trump presidency and presidencies like it around the world against climate action, why have they felt compelled in the last two weeks to change their global policy to one which will now support carbon neutrality by 2050. Let me tell you, it's not because of people like me, because they know where I stand. They know the ground is shifting underneath their feet in terms of their readership and viewership across the world. So get onto your local newspaper editor, get onto your local journalist, get onto your local television outlet. Let me tell you, add all that together, it really has an effect and the Murdoch example is just one. And the further one in this country is if Morrison, the current Australian Prime Minister, does what I think he'll do and bring about a, a U-turn on his current hostility to carbon neutrality by 2050, and for example, a 50% or 52% cut uh, on carbon emissions by 2030 against 2005, it'll be purely because the ground underneath him has shifted because Australian public opinion has shifted and that's because individual citizens like you, their Australian equivalents, 
have got onto the phone, have written the letter, have sent the email, and have become local activists. So it is fundamentally important that this continue. You know, climate change is a very hard issue because it's it's caused by invisible gases that are odorless and Although the time frames are very fast by scientific standards, they can seem very slow in the course of a human life, I think. Um, do you have any advice for people who are trying to highlight the importance of this issue and what, what they can do about it? Yeah, in terms of the actual debate, I think there is um, two lines of argument which are particularly potent in the, let's call it the global political mix. One is the cost of inaction is infinitely greater than the cost of action. The cost of action is simply one of adjustment from one form of energy production to another. Of course, it's challenging, but every single major economic adjustment in economic history has been from the industrial revolution to the present. So the cost of inaction being far greater than the cost of action is message number one. And if you need a data, folks, just look at what various national insurance bodies of the United States, of other countries in the world, are saying the insurance costs now with extreme weather caused by climate. The big believers on climate change are the national insurance bodies around the world. And secondly, that brings me to my when you next have your big flood in the United States, you next have your big drought in the United States, you next have your big superstorm where suddenly all this Caribbean weather is migrating up to the Hamptons. For God's sake, do not be apologetic about raising the climate change flag to the, to the mast, because that translates to what you just said before about the abstractions of invisible gases into physically observable realities, which is my house has just been flattened. My house has just burned down. My farm is no longer capable of being farmed because there's no longer any water. That's pretty physical. It's those two things together. Mr. Prime Minister, you have just left, left us with an extraordinary amount of wisdom and experience in this hour. And, and we are so grateful that you took time on your birthday of all days uh, to do this with us. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we, we are deeply grateful for you joining us. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the recording of this event is going to be available um, uh, tomorrow at uh, Center on Global Energy Policy website. Um, uh, our Climate Week NYC series continues on Thursday, September 23rd. Uh, at 9.30 a.m., we have an event with Mark Carney and Mark Globley, and at 3 p.m., a conversation with Mary Nichols and Jim Farley. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for watching. Uh, big thanks uh, to Prime Minister Kevin Rudd for taking the time on his birthday to join us. All the best. Glad to join you, David. All the best to everybody. Thank you.